Hey everybody, Ed Holmwood, Old Guy Hi-Fi Channel. I hope you're all doing well today. Today's video is going to be about this lovely Marantz integrated amplifier, the PM74D. Uh, it is a unique unit. It is uh, 105 watts a channel, but 25 of those watts or 25% of those watts is in Class A. And we'll talk about how that happens and why. We'll go over a little bit of the history of this product and its connection to a very, very famous audio engineer, uh, named Ken Ishiwata. This is a Ken Ishiwata design product. Um, and we'll talk about all that. We'll talk about the history of Marantz and the fact that when this was sold, Marantz was two separate companies at that time. So we'll kind of go over that in depth. So without any further ado, let's talk about the PM74D. So this is the Marantz PM74D, close up look at it. And uh, it's a really interesting, rather robust and a pretty hefty unit. I think it's about 30 something pounds for uh, a medium chassis. And you'll see when we get inside why. What makes this unit unique is the fact that it's what they call quarter A. Now it's rated 105 watts a channel, which means 25% of that 105 watts will be delivered in pure class A. Now it does that in a unique way. Class A amplifiers typically run balls out all the time and that's why they create so much heat. Now people have gotten around that in AB by doing what's called Class H, uh, which is a switching power supply or Class D, which does away with it altogether uh, because it, they're very efficient, although they have a Class D sound. So this does it in a different way by using what's called an automatic voltage shift supply, which allows the power supply to keep the transistors roll on all the time, which is important for class A is the transistors never shut off, um, but it doesn't require the power supply to run full tilt all the time. So this will get warm, but it won't get hot to the touch like many class A amplifiers do. So that kind of makes it unique, that quarter A. The PM84 and PM94 also had that quarter A function, um, but with slightly different transistors, which we'll talk about when we get inside. Now the actual preamp itself is a class A, full class A, dual mono design, which is why you have separate bass and treble controls for each side of the amplifier, left and right. Uh, and then we've got power, we've got a great headphone output, which is a pure class A headphone output. It can run two pairs of speakers, no problem. Tone defeat button, tape copy from tape one to tape two, tape monitor, which is traditional in these day, this day and age. It's got a built-in phono stage, which can be moving magnet or moving coil. A loudness button, yay, we all love loudness. A mono button, which is great for old recordings, and CD Direct, which I'll talk about in a second. One of the neat features about this is you have a selector that allows you to choose your input, you know, CD phono, tuner, TV, video auxiliaries, right? And then you have what's called a source selector. So let's say I have my turntable, my cassette deck, and my CD player hooked up to the unit. And I want to record from the phonograph to the cassette deck, but I want to listen to the CD player. So I leave this in CD mode and I come down here and I choose phono and now the tape deck will only get the signal from the to turntable and I can continue to listen to the CD. That's a really unique fe feature. It wasn't uncommon in the day. Uh, obviously bounce control and volume control. Now CD direct, what does that do? It works for phono and CD and it is the shortest path through the amplifier. So we come in on the inputs, we go only to the volume control, which by the way is a really high quality Penny Giles uh, volume pot. And we bypass tone controls, all the input selectors, any of the ancillary uh, circuits that it would need to go through. And so the signal comes in volume control out to the amplifier for the shortest, most direct signal path uh, and the best signal quality. So that's the Marantz uh, on the front panel. Give me a couple minutes and I'm gonna open it up. We'll do a deep dive inside. Now, before we go inside, I wanted to show you the back panel of the unit. Um, the CD and phono inputs are gold-plated RCA connectors. And again, that indicates the CD direct. You get a tuner, auxiliary one, auxiliary two, TV video. They started labeling it that way in the late 80s, obviously because of hi-fi VCRs and stereo TV signal and so forth and so on. And then two uh, tape inputs, the ground for phono. These are the original uh, speaker binding posts. I, they're not even binding posts. They take a bare wire. There's a slot on the bottom. You stick it up in there and tighten it. They're terrible. So I took the liberty of modifying it to put in banana plugs uh, on the A system. I've never had a second set of speakers hooked up to, hooked up to it. So, you know, I could do it if I wanted. Uh, and then the nice thing about products of this era were you had additional outlets on the back. So if you were doing a stack of equipment like the tuner I showed you before, 
you can actually plug it in here and on a switched one, turn this on, turns on the tuner. Plug your cassette deck in here, turn this on, turns on the cassette deck or CD player. Or if you have, let's say you have a light over your turntable, you can have this unswitched and the light will stay on when you want it to regardless. So really, really neat. Another neat thing I wanted to show you real quick and bear with me for a moment while I tilt this up. And I hope you're gonna be able to see it. Here on the bottom is a sticker, and this is actually from the factory, shown the model. The purpose of the sample, this was an advanced pre-prototype. Uh, and this was manufactured in November, on November 9th, 1987, prior to the introduction of the product. Why is that unique? Well, kind of the unique thing about it is, because it was a pre-production prototype, it is serial number 10. It's the 10th unit manufactured. This unit was Marantz's demo piece for the 1988 Winter Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas and the 1988 Summer Consumer Electronics Show in Chicago. And then it was a factory demo sample that um, the manufacturer's reps would take around and demo for dealers to get them to sign up or to buy the product or do demonstrations in the sound room. Marantz held on to this, Dynascan Marantz held on to this until the, until they sold uh, Marantz US to Philips and then they had a fire sale at their warehouse in Aurora, Illinois. And we went in and bought a whole bunch of stuff. I bought tons of gear for family members. I bought, as I mentioned, two of these, a PM84 and a PM94, which I wound up selling to someone else. I didn't have it for very long. So anyway, that's the unique thing about this it was an advanced pre-production piece, serial number 10. And I, that's one of the reasons why I probably will never sell it. So let me reconfigure. We're gonna go inside and do a deep dive. And it's gonna be handheld, so I apologize for the uh, shakiness. Well, here we are doing the handhold on the inside. And I made a mistake. I said that this was a Penny Giles pot. It was on the PM84 and 94. This is an Alps potentiometer, still super high quality. So as you can see, the layout is pretty simple, pretty old school heat sinks, big E-Core iron trans, uh, transformer, power transformer, and then the capacitance got 22,000 microfarads, excuse me, 24,000 microfarads, and then another 16,000 microfarads. So down along the heat sink, and I'm gonna kinda zoom, are the output de devices down through here. Uh, you really can't see it, so let me come back out. So what's uh, unique about this unit, most amplifiers use what's called a push-pull, this does, but most amplifiers use a single device for the positive sine wave and a single device for the negative sine wave. This actually does pairs of transistors. So there's a, <clears throat> a pair of uh, actually uh, simple MOSFET transistors for the positive sine wave and a pair for the negative sine wave. Um, and that makes, obviously, uh, gives you the ability to have pure class A because the transistors never turn off and it makes it very powerful. So the, uh, as I mentioned, the preamp is dual mono. And actually what you can see is these heat sinks, the, the JFETs here are actually the preamp uh, amplifier transistors and they do an excellent job. And you'll also notice, and I'm gonna kind of zoom in here a little bit, there are a ton of transistors on their own individual copper heat sinks. And you'll see them all through the unit. So let me see if I can find that one. There's that one. And again, that's, you know, heat sinks, copper heat sinks. Now, one of the things I did do is I went through and replaced some of the capacitors. Let me zoom back out again. So if the capacitor, these are two of the ones I replaced. I don't know if you can see down in there. Let me see if I can get in there a little tighter. You can see that dirty ring around the base of the capacitor. So that those capacitors had leaked. And when I replaced them, if the capacitor was in the signal path, I replaced them with Nichicon capacitors, really good quality. And if the capacitor was not in the signal path, I used a Rubicon uh, capacitor because it really didn't have any effect on the sound quality. Again, that's kind of a look inside. Um, one of the, kind of the cool things about this is I don't know if you noticed, the screws are all copper and all of the screws holding the unit together are copper. In the PM84, the entire chassis was copper clad, same with the PM94, um, which again reduces noise, kind of, I don't know if it creates a Faraday cage or not, but it really reduces noise. This one, they didn't do it because obviously the price point didn't, didn't uh, justify it. So that's a look inside the Marantz PM74D uh, and we're gonna cut away well, as you can see, this is a really robustly built unit. It was high quality components and it was built to a very high standard. 
given the day and it's price point at around $900 retail price. So there wasn't really any other amplifiers you could purchase that would offer that class A performance, quarter A performance uh, at really any price to tell you went up the line from the PM74D to the PM84 and then ultimately the PM94, which was the Mac Daddy of the product category. So quarter A, beautiful sound, really robust build. Um, and it's an interesting thing because at the time this was manufactured and sold, there were actually two Marantz companies. And let me go a little bit into it. So Saul Marantz formed Marantz in 1947, and he built sub-assemblies for other companies. And in 1952, he introduced his first product, a preamp called the Consolette. Um, he continued to manufacture products in the U.S. in Kew Gardens, actually on Long Island, and uh, was doing fine. It was a little bit challenging. I mean, Saul Marantz is a pioneer. He can, you know, mention in the same names, in the same breath as Avery Fisher, uh, Sidney Harmon and Bernie Carden, James B. Lansing. I mean, some really amazing people. And he was one of those guys, definitely one of those guys. But Marantz was struggling a little bit, as a lot of companies in the day were. And he wound up selling the company to Superscope. Now, Superscope was the U.S. distributor for all things Sony. Now, Superscope knew that Sony was going to be starting Sony America and distribute their own product. So they were going to lose that line. So they bought Marantz. Now, Saul stayed with the company until 1968 and was a guiding light. And then he left kind of semi-retired and he popped up again with a partnered with a gentleman named John Dahlquist and they came out with a really unique speaker product known as the Dahlquist and one of the first ones was the DQ10 and look it up it's pretty interesting. So in 1966 Superscope moved production of all Marantz products from the United States to Japan when they partnered with a company called Standard Radio Corp. Now Standard had been around for a long time. They built uh, products under their own name, all different kinds. But what was interesting is when Marantz came to them and gave them the specifications and the design criteria and the quality that they were looking for, because Marantz was really, is still really high quality, um, Standard Radio Corp had to up its game a lot and wound up becoming a real classic manufacturer for a lot of other products, um, some of which are kind of interesting. Um, they did built a lot of products for Denon Onkyo. Now, I don't know if you know, when Denon was formed, it was called Denso Onkyo, and then it was later changed to Nippon Columbia, which was then Denon, and they spun off the Onkyo brand. Anyway, it's all incestuous. <laughs> So in 1974, Marantz builds a, builds a factory in Europe and Belgium to satisfy U, the European market because they were getting a lot of traction, a lot of really high praise in, in Europe. And in Europe, most people bought uh, integrated amplifiers rather than receivers because the FM or the radio bands available in Europe are way different than the US. There's multiple. So people would buy a separate tuner if they wanted that. And actually, I have the tuner for this that matches it. It's called an ST54. And there it is. Um, and it was a really nice piece as well. Great tuner. Um, it actually, this actually made Stereophile's recommended components list one year, I think in 88 or 89. Um, really unique piece, but you can see this matches all the other amplifiers as well. And you can see the combination. So Standard Radio 1975 changed their name to Marantz Japan because of the relationship they had with Super Scope Marantz. Well, in 1980, Super Scope sell, sold Marantz worldwide, not US and Canada, worldwide to Philips. And that's when you started to see um, the product being branded Marantz and then the Super Scope logo on it as well, because all they were basically doing was distributing product at that point. They were having some things built, but they were also distributing a lot of the Marantz Japan. Philips Marantz Japan uh, products as well. So in 1982, Superscope sold the U.S. arm of Marantz, the U.S. and Can Canadian arm, to Dynascan, which is the Cobra radar detector people, Cobra CB radios. Cobra also owned a brand called Lloyd's, which was a real low-end Kmart kind of hi-fi and clock radios and little portable radios and things like that. So they bought Marantz. Now, Marantz had a facility in Chatsworth, California, which was a warehouse service facility and so forth. But Dynascan's headquarters were in the Chicago area in Aurora, Illinois. And at the time, 
We were Morant's dealers when, when I was working retail here in Chicago. There was We had five stores and we were Morant's dealers. So we dealt with the Dynascan people. And so Dynascan went to Asia and I'm not exactly sure where they went, but they had, they decided to go kind of department store level, which was a shame because they were trying to make as much money as they could with Morant's. Got to take care of the stockholders. So they went offshore and they had these rack systems built where you got speakers, a matching cabinet, a turntable, a cassette deck, a tuner, an amp, an EQ, all in one piece. And then you had good, better, best. And they were sold at, uh, at places like Silo and Fretter and Highland Superstores and Circuit City and JCPenney and Sears and places like that. And then they had another line because home theater was starting to break at that point in the mid 80s with Dolby Surround and then Dolby Pro Logic in late 80s. Um, they had a product line manufactured for them in Japan called the Century Series. And the Century Series was actually quite good. It was beautiful to look at and it sounded really good and performed really good. It had some unique technologies um, like the heat tunnel inside, which is how they cooled the uh, transistors, the power output transistors. Very powerful, very beautiful really good performing equipment you hardly find it anymore because it was so short-lived so morantz or excuse me dynascan morantz here in the us also imported morantz japan phillips morantz japan product and that's where this came from so this was not had nothing to do with morantz us other than they imported it and, and sold it to the retail network um, and this was again the japanese product so uh, in 1992 dynascan sold everything to Philips, all the US distribution, dealer network, everything. And when they were closing out the warehouse, that's when I, we went and with a truck and loaded up. And I wound up with two of these with matching tuners. And I had one set with wood sides, uh, which I ultimately sold to another collector uh, not too long ago. And then I had a PM84, which I love to death, which I was my primary amplifier for many, many years. Until like an idiot, I dropped it because it, the thing weighed like 60 pounds. Uh, I dropped it and broke it and I'm an idiot. I had also purchased a PM94, but I had bought that for someone else. I played with it for a little while. Oh my God, was that glorious. And they're worth tons of money. And the only place you can find them anymore is Japan, uh, where, they're, where they go for several thousands of dollars. So the PM74, uh, there was one below called the PM54. I think in Europe there was a PM64 for that European integrated market. The original PM74, which was not a quarter A amp, the PM74D, which was the 84D, 94, which were the quarter A amplifiers. So that's the Japan Philips Marantz and the relationship with the Dynascan US Marantz. So in 2001, Dynascan, or excuse me, in 97, 92, as I said, Phillips bought the whole kit and caboodle. They had Morantz worldwide. In 97, Saul died at the age of 85, although he hadn't been involved with the company. They, they'd invite him out and have him do, you know, kind of political events and, you know, meet and greets and stuff like that. In 2002, Morantz Japan formed, uh, uh, in 2001, excuse me, Morantz Japan sold or bought all of Morantz worldwide from Phillips. Phillips was, who knows what's going on with Phillips. Uh, Phillips, I think, just only makes some medical gear these days. I mean, they had TVs and VCRs and all, you know, CD players and amplifiers and everything under the Phillips brand name. And then they had the Magnavox product. So in 2001, Morantz Japan buys everything. They've got the worldwide distribution. In 2002, Morantz Japan, or Morantz now, and Denon merged to form DM Holdings. And DM Holdings, marketed and distributed in the U.S. the uh, Denon Morantz product and also they acquired Boston Acoustics. Interesting. So then DM Holdings was cruising along, although they weren't as successful at marketing it. Um, things are starting to change in the mid 2000s audio wise. Um, and I don't know that they didn't respond properly. They were also very focused on the pro gear because both Morantz and Denon made pro uh, audio gear, you know, pro audio recorders, uh, pro rack mount CD players, things like that. Well, in 2008, Morantz, excuse me, Philips finally sells its last small interest in, uh, in the, in the company to DM Holdings, its remaining stake in, in the Morantz brand, which wasn't a significant amount, but they sold it all 
it's done that ended a 28 year relationship between Phillips and Morantz. So now DM hold DM holding is DM holdings is its own entity down in Morantz, Boston acoustics. Well, in, uh, 2014, the DM, uh, Holdings was purchased by a company called In Music Brands, which was another large conglomerate that was trying to assemble different companies. Unfortunately, I think Boston Acoustics got killed off at that time. And then in 2017, In Music Brands, then in Morant's Holdings and those other brands gets bought by Sound United. And Sound United is a long story about Sound United, but they own some big name brands, Morant's, Denon, Bowers and Wilkins. Uh, uh, class A, um, definitive technology, and I'm sure I'm skipping one of them. If I am, I'll put it down here in the video. Uh, and then in 2019, or excuse me, in 2017, when Sound United bought Morantz, they severed their ties with Ken Ishiwata, and we'll talk about Ken in a second. And then in 2019, or in 2017, Ken went to work for Rotel, and we'll talk about. It. So who is Ken Ishiwata? Ken Ishiwata was the brand manager, quote unquote for Marantz, but he was an audio engineer and he started working with Marantz in the 70s. And he was the guy that gave Marantz its sound. He would take an existing product and they, he would listen to it, modify it, change it and make it better. And then that's what they moved forward with. So all prototypes, all potential products and, and conceptual products went through Ken. He's the guy who voiced all of that stuff. He was a great engineer. He was also a musician. Um, and so, He's the one that gave Marantz that legendary sound, that unbelievable, sweet, powerful, authoritative, super wide bandwidth, high current stuff. Uh, and so Ken was the driving force behind the sound and the quality of Marantz for 40 years. As a matter of fact, he actually, they came out with some special Ken Ishiwata limited edition product called the Ruby Key amplifiers. And they're still bring thousands of dollars, amazing quality. And these days, Marantz does still build some good product, like the PM8 and then the, uh, what is it, the 3000 integrated, really good. I'll put the, the names of that product down here that are really good. Um, although nowadays, the Marantz product, a lot of it is made in China, isn't everything. So that's where Marantz stood. Now, Ken, obviously, Sound United didn't care about having Ken around because, again, they're a big conglomerate. And they got other brands to worry about and they got stockholders to worry about. So Ken left and he wound up going to work for Rotel. And while he was at Rotel, he helped them voice the, the latest Michi products and Rotel's products, including the A-Line series of integrated amplifiers. And if you're familiar with the Rotel A11 Tribute, that's a tribute to Ken Ishiwata. He joined Rotel in 2017. He passed away in 2019. He wasn't with Rotel very long, but he had a big impact. And of course, he was a legendary figure in audio. I mean, just an absolute legend, uh, and especially in Japan, but really within the industry, everybody knew who Ken was and everybody knew what he did with Marantz. And he came, went over to Rotel and started doing the same thing, but unfortunately it was kind of short-lived. So anyway, that's the Marantz PM74D. We're going to cut away and we're going to do some sound clips with it. And then I'll be back for a little finalized thing.
Hey, everybody. Hopefully those sound clips worked out fine and you can hear it. Um, I wanted to let you know during the sound clips, the subwoofer was not being used. It was just the Marantz directly to my ELAC uh, speaker. So there was no subwoofer in there at all. And I hope the audio quality is decent. So anyway, that's a wrap up on the Marantz PM74D. My baby. I really love this amplifier. Um, I probably will never sell it. Um, it just, it sounds so sweet. It's so unique. Uh, and it's, there is a big sentimental attachment to it. Um, I was fortunate enough, obviously, to have been a reseller of Moran's product. I was fortunate enough to have met Mr. Ishiwata uh, on several occasions. It's just meet and greet, shake hands, hi, how are you kind of thing. He wouldn't know me out of a crowd at all. Um, but I got a chance to meet a legend, and that was really important. Uh, I've been fortunate to meet several industry legends. So anyway, Moran's PM74D. I hope you enjoyed. So I would really greatly appreciate a like on the video and I would appreciate your subscription. 80% of you that watch my videos aren't subscribed and it's not a big deal to do, I hope. Please give me a subscription. I'm trying to get to a thousand subscribers. I'm over 750 right now and I'm so pleased you guys even care about what I have to say. But I would love your subscription. I would appreciate it. Now, give me a comment. Did you own Morantz in the past? What did you like about Morantz? What did you not like about my video? What did you like about my video? Your feedback helps me try to make this channel better and do better you know, myself. And hopefully they're getting a little bit better. <laughs> I still have to learn to edit and do stuff like that. So again, give me a like and a subscribe. Um, and I appreciate it. Now, in my videos, if you have a comment or you want to have a long form discussion with me, you can email me at, it'll be right here. And that email address is also in the description of each video, along with an equipment list of all the stuff I use uh, in my sound system here. And also there are some affiliate links, Amazon affiliate links in there. And if you decide to buy something, one of the pieces I own and you do that, I will make a tiny commission. It helps drive the channel forward. This is not an, a living for me, but it, there is a cost attached to making these things. So the, the affiliate links are in there. Also too, there are some playlists from Tidal Cobos and Spotify. Um, just some interesting music, the crazy stuff I listen to, some great classical suggestions. And again, I would appreciate a comment. I would appreciate a like and subscribe. And I'm really grateful for the time you took to watch this. I know this turned out to be a bit of a long video. So thank you so very much. I, I am uh, I'm flattered that you guys even care about what I have to say. And sometimes I don't care about what I have to say. So anyway, this is Ed Homewood, the Old Guy Hi-Fi Channel, signing off.